All right, guys, uh, welcome to the podcast. We're going to do a real quick mic check. So uh, everyone named Mike, if you'll subscribe really quick, that would help us a lot. Thanks. <laughs> nice open. Uh, today, I did actually want to start with um, kind of a different opening. Um, we're talking about some pretty heavy topics today. Not heavy as in they're super controversial. There is some controversy, naturally. But... So we're going to be covering topics of tithing. Should the ch- Christians in the church today still tithe? But before we do, let's just say uh, TJ and I we don't we don't receive any. You don't receive any tithes, do you? No. Yeah, and I we don't want yeah. your tithes. If I do, I don't know about us. Yeah, yeah. And we don't want tithes. That's not what we're after. We're not money grubbing anything like that. And when we do talk about when we talk about issues like tithing. The first thing that we need to do is make sure that we do have a heart for giving. Because whether you think you should tithe or not, what the Bible is very clear about, Christians give. It's the natural heart condition of a Christian to want to give. So before we open this conversation, I'm going to give everybody just a few seconds here of silence for you to pause this podcast and say a prayer. Ask God to renew in you a heart for giving. Welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, guys. I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Knoll, here with your other co-host, TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. Good morning. What if they're listening in the evening? Good morning. Okay. It's morning somewhere. <laughs> uh, so, as I already mentioned, today we're covering the topic of tithing, looking at, I believe it's Genesis 14, where Abraham's ta- or Abram at this point is talking to Melchizedek. And gives a tenth of his earnings from war to him as kind of an offering. Uh, Some people call it a tithe. Some people don't. We're going to discuss why there's a controversy. Is that a tithe? Should we tithe today? What has the church believed historically? All that and how we can still be united today as believers. But before we do, I'm going to review some interaction from our audience. If TJ will allow it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we asked... What the worst part of Monday was, we asked, is it, is it the waking up early for you or is it the going to work for you? And, uh, <laughs> nine people said it was going to work. Two people said it was waking up early. So a pretty, uh, pretty clear signal there that our listeners don't like going back to work on Mondays. Yeah. Yeah. I They're okay remember. waking up. They just they I can't don't want to have to go the work. Last time I worked on a Monday. <laughs> yeah, TJ works every other weekend. It's just special, on the weekend. Special circumstances. Yeah, for now. Yeah, it'll, it's probably subject to change. Um, that being said, we're going to jump into today's silly question. <laughs> TJ, this was originally going to be ping pong, and I changed it. This question I made for you. Mm, oh, oh, yeah. is it the, the tennis question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had to have any animal without opposable thumbs. As your tennis partner, because I don't want you to just be like, oh, a monkey, that's too easy. What would you go with? We're playing teams. Doubles. No, yeah. Me and my animal partner versus you and your animal yeah. partner. So, for the record, uh, I don't really play tennis that much. I just like it a lot. Uh, but I, I'm going to need you to go first. Okay. Um. I've discussed this with some other people, and I think that my answer is probably not the best, but I'm going to stick with it anyway because it was my original answer. I'm going with a giant tortoise simply because I feel like even if he does literally nothing, which he probably will, covers a large enough part of the court that, you know, if you all hit it, it might hit back up. I might be able to do something with that. Yeah. That's a terrible answer. It is. I was just going to. I've heard some much better answers already. So initially I was thinking, my first thought really was uh, just a monkey, but that doesn't count. <laughs> but I wasn't even going to like, my plan wasn't for them to use their hands. It was for them to use their tails. Uh, and hmm. so then I was like, well, yeah. they have thumbs. So I was going to choose a possum, uh, but they're too small. Uh, they can use their tail. But they're just not fast enough to cover the court that I need. Yeah. So then I decided I'm 
I'd probably just choose a large dog. Uh, but huh. but they chase too much, which isn't good for a tennis doubles partner. Also, they'd probably catch the ball yeah, at some that's, point. That's, yeah, yeah, chase too much. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with like a a brown bear, no a black bear, because they don't chase, but they're pretty similar to dogs and they can be trained. What would your team name be? We don't have a team name. Uh, that's how they're formatted. Okay. Well, it'd be Blackwell and then his last name. Black Bear. Blackwell and Black Bear. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Blackwell and Bear. Okay. And then it'd probably be abbreviated to Black slash Bear. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we'll hear some of our listeners, you guys out there, let us know. We're going to ask this question to you and uh, just let us know what tennis partner you would choose. Yeah. And no, no repeat answers. Come up with your own thing. If someone else beats you Correct. there, that's just too bad. Yeah. <laughs> all right uh so the purpose of this series which we do once a month uh, i think yeah. Uh, yeah, this usually. is our dividing scriptures series we just kind of we we're going through it chronologically and we're just picking up controversial parts of the bible uh, you know more controversial pretty much the whole thing is controversial yeah technically but uh today we're doing tithing and you know, we don't. We try not to give our views when we do these episodes because they aren't important. No, because we would settle the argument too easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we are obviously right about everything. Uh, but we just we want to make people aware of the viewpoints that there are at yeah. least the prevailing ones. Well, it's sort of like you don't want the moderator for a political debate to be of any party. Right. Uh, we, as the people who are going to discuss how to have unity with differing views. It's just not good for us to give our view. That's not productive. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we we did want to start with reading Genesis 14, which is where you know this comes from. Uh, Genesis 14 and 7. And I am going to read it off of this index card because I... <laughs> yeah, he I didn't memorize the book of Genesis yet for some reason. Listen, I could do it, but I, I just, <laughs> I've got other things to worry about. Yeah. So uh, Genesis 14 and 7, and this is from the... Is this from Christian Standard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that for you. Which uh, quick plug, quick plug. In a couple weeks, we're gonna have Doctor Alexander Longman the third, right? Or no, Doctor Trimper. Trimper Longman the third. Yeah, he's gonna be on the podcast, and he's one of the people who worked on the Christian Standard Bible. Yeah, he makes yeah. a good book. A few, <laughs> only because he makes a good book. Uh, yeah, you don't love the but, Bible. Uh, <laughs> so Genesis fourteen and seven, Christian Standard Bible reads: uh, After Abram returned from defeating. Uh, Kedor Laomer, that's a mess of a name. <laughs> Bible names. Uh, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Shave Valley. That's king, uh, Shave, however you say it. Yeah. It translates king. Uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High creator of heaven and earth uh, and blessed be god most high who has handed over your enemies to you and abram gave him a tenth of everything and then king of sodom said to abram uh, give me the people but take the possessions for yourself but abram said to the king of sodom i have raised my hand in an oath to the lord god most high creator of heaven and earth that I will not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of the men who came with me, Aner, Eshral, and Mamre, they can take their share. So that was kind of Abram's way of condemning uh, health care. <laughs> Social okay, welfare. So there, there are so many nuances to the arguments over the scripture. Um just immediately sticking out if you if you read it and you really know Old Testament law, which this is the Bible nerd in me coming out, but what should immediately stick out to you is, hey, he said he wouldn't take anything from man so that God would be honored, but he did take from Melchizedek and give a tenth to Melchizedek, which infers that there's something more than just man to this Melchizedek character, right? But also, if you know your Old Testament law, you're thinking... The tithe specifically says it cannot be associated with an oath. And he just gave an oath. 
So what's that about? So many more, so much more nuances than that. But uh, first, we want to ask the simple question first. Who is Melchizedek, right? Some people believe Melchizedek was an ar a literary archetype pointing to a later savior figure who will come out in one of the other books of the Bible. <clears throat> Jesus. But uh, some people think he was a, a real person that was a type of the priest, prophet, king, which would one day be the priest lineage of Jesus and not of any earthly kingdom. Uh, some people think he was just some king, you know, yeah. just a guy. Melchizedek. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, guys, th there's some people believe he was literally Jesus. It was just Jesus came as Melchizedek, you know. Um, some people think that... Let's see, what was some of the other... Uh, he's the angel of the Lord. That's a character that comes up in the Bible a lot. We'll probably do a later episode on the angel of the Lord. There's a lot of debate over who that is. Uh, so honestly, the long answer short is we have no idea. Within your own local church congregation, there's probably 13 different ideas who this guy is. No one knows. It is a... You know, we talk about first, second, and third tier issues yeah. concerning uh, the Bible and everything. And how, you know, first tier, we can't consider each other Christian brother and sister. Second tier, maybe go to different churches. Third tier, we can go to the same church and disagree. This might be below third tier somewhere. Mm -hmm. You might disagree with yourself from one moment to the next because it's just such a confusing topic. Yeah, and I feel like it's, we talk about the tiers a lot and then like, it's, yeah. it's pretty easy to get confused about how it's built. And I think it'd be pretty easy to disagree with how it's built. But I, for me, tier one issues are on the bottom. Unless we're assembling them into like a wheel. Okay. Just because like, hey, without this one, you can't. Because you, <laughs> you notice that I do this? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I clearly go first, second, yeah. third. Okay. That's that's funny. You it, know, it, well, just, well, it, it makes, makes yeah. sense to go from the bottom though. Because first, that's our foundation. Who is Jesus? Who is mm. God? Yeah. yeah. But Your, yeah, your way makes more sense. I want to talk about that. They both make sense though. Yeah, that's Which true. is why it's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that being said, let's go to the bigger question. The biggest question first, when we're talking about should we tithe, should we not tithe, a lot of people point to this story and they say that Abram tithed to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek basically standing in for God. He is the priest in this sense. So that Abram is the low priest tithing to the high priest that is Melchizedek. Um, because he gave a tenth of his earnings for more. So they say, okay, yeah, that, that's that's it. Some people say he gave a tenth of all of his earnings. I just don't think that's you can back that up with the Bible. But honestly, doesn't matter. The question is, is this a tithe? So there's so many things that we've talked about previously in this series that feed into this, right? Um, first, how do you read the Old Testament? If it was written... I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I read the Hawaiian Pigeon Bible exclusively. <laughs> if you read it as a literalist, like our friend uh, Pastor Chris Galloway, is what it is, this is just what happened. If you read it like a lot of other people, as this is a book that was written later on, maybe not even by Moses, this was written as the law. So to say that this happened before the law makes no sense because this story is just part of the law. Right? Mm -hmm. And... There's a lot of nuances in that, but the first thing you have to ask is, how do we read the Bible, and what other places does the Bible define what a tithe is? Yeah, so uh, to better understand the argument of whether or not this counts as a tithe, uh, we can look at the three laws commanded in the old law, the three tithes commanded in the old law. Yeah, which, for those who didn't know, yeah, there isn't just this command in the Old Testament to that you should tithe. Three different places mm -hmm. it talks about you should tithe. So really, tithing in the Old Testament instead of ten percent is like thirty or what? What did I tell you the other day? It was like twenty three point three. Thirty, but if you average it out over seven years, it's like twenty two point eight. It's yeah, because it's the seventh year they don't tithe at all. But yeah. anyway, uh, the first one we wanted to talk about was the Levitical tithe, uh, which comes from Numbers eighteen and twenty, uh, which says. Uh, the Lord told Aaron, you will not have an inheritance in their land. There will be no portion among them for you. I am your portion and your inheritance among the Israelites. Look, I have given the Levites every tenth in Israel as an inheritance in return for their work. They do the work of the tent of meeting. 
the Israelites must never again come near the tent of meeting, or they will incur guilt and die. The Levites will do the work of the tent of meeting, and they will bear the consequences of their iniquity. The Levites will not receive an inheritance among the Israelites. This is a permanent statute throughout your generations. For I have given them the tenth that the Israelites present to the Lord as a contribution for their inheritance. That is why I told them that they would not receive an inheritance among the Israelites. So he's just like, hey, they don't get anything, but everyone else gives a tenth and then you get that. Yeah. Instead the Levites were the priest tribe. Yeah. Which, um... I think it's right after that part of scripture where it talks about amongst the Levites, they all give 10% to the higher priest. So it's a 10% of 10%. They're getting like 1%. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so some things to note about that real quick before we move on to the other tithes is it's not tithing your money. It's tithing your land and food so that you're making sure that the priest have land and food. They're able to survive basically. Um, one thing I noted that was really interesting is that's 11 tribes giving 10%, which means really the priests are treated 10% better yeah. than everybody else, mm-hmm. which is important. Uh, I, I think even if you don't think the old law applies now, the principles still do. And the principle here is that treat your pastor a little bit better than you treat everybody else, you know? Make yeah. sure he's taken care of even more. Right. Yeah. Okay. So especially, the second... Especially in like our kind of denomination. Yeah. Where we, you know, we don't have like a ton of money, so... Yeah. Yeah. It's just important to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, so the second tithe comes from Deuteronomy 14, and this is the tithe of feasts. They were The Israelites were told, Each year you are to set aside a tenth of all the produce grown in your fields. You are to eat a tenth of your grain, new wine, and fresh oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place where he chooses to have his name dwell so that you will always learn to fear the Lord your God. But if the distance is too great for you to carry it, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far away from you, and and since the Lord God has blessed you, then you can exchange it for silver, take the silver in your hand, and go to the place the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the silver on anything you want. Cattle, sheep, goats, wine, beer, or anything you desire. You are to feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your family. Do not neglect the Levite within your city gates, since he has no portion or inheritance among you. Yeah. Basically, uh, they're setting a tenth of everything aside, and they are told to party it up. Make sure the pastors also get to party it up. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, Rumspringa, like modern Rumspringa. Uh, Amish communities send out their 18-year-olds for a year, and they're like, hey, go crazy. And then decide if you want to come back or not. <laughs> I just I just imagine, because Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, I just imagine myself all year putting 10% of everything back, being like, yeah, this Thanksgiving is going to be great this year. Man. <laughs> Could you imagine? Just, just crazy. Just Thanksgiving every seventh year? Or, you know, whatever. Yeah, it'll be every same, year. You same. just skip Thanksgiving on the seventh year, apparently. <laughs> Worth it. Which would also suck. <laughs> Uh, but the, the third one we wanted to talk about was the tithe of charity, which rounds it out and brings it to that 30%, uh, which is in Deuteronomy 14, 28 uh, through 29. Uh, it says, at the end of every three years, bring a tenth of all your produce for that year and store it within your city gates. Then the Levite, who has no portion or inheritance among you, the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow within your city gates may come, eat, and be satisfied. And the Lord your God will bless you in all the work that your hands do. That you do. But it's like, you know, give to people. Yeah. Give to people who can't give for themselves. Yeah. Which we'll, we'll talk about this later, but that's actually the only tithe that the current Jewish people of the world still follow. They do the tithe of charity. They give to any charity they want 10% of their income. Yeah. Yeah. But, so there's a few different arguments that people make from these ties. And and we we just wrote a couple down. Uh, A lot of people say that these ties are only to support the Levites and the poor. You'll notice that the poor comes up a lot. So not a church organization, not a religious organization, but pastors and poor people. Yeah, and I appreciate that. (laughs) As a pastor or a a poor person? person. (laughs) Okay. These ties do not apply to money, but are ties of land and food. We already mentioned that. Um... 
The tithes do not apply outside the land of Israel. It says, uh, which not in the scriptures we read, but it says in other places, if you are in another land, you are not expected to give your tithes in that way. Hmm. Um, and they also don't apply to the poor. It explicitly says in the old law that the poor should not give their 10% because, well, they need it, basically. Yeah. Um, and tithing in this way is actually 20 to 30%, which we mentioned, altogether, rather than the 10% suggested today. And uh, which we we mentioned some of the other problems with calling what Abram did a tithe, but some people will also throw in there that uh, in the old law, it says you're tithing your income, and it explicitly says not your spoils of war. You're not supposed to take any spoils of war. Mm-hmm. Whereas what Abram did was take spoils of war and give 10% to God. So that's kind of a different thing according to the people who are on the other side of the tithe argument. Right. I say other side. We don't have a side. Yeah. But, you know, the other side is in not the traditional side. Right. And so uh, we have, you know, there are proponents of tithing in the church today. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the Which, traditional view. Yeah. Where, sort yeah. of. Hey, guys, we just wanted to take a quick break to tell you a few ways that you can support us, the whole church podcast, your favorite church unity podcast. Yeah, so you can donate to our cash app using the tag that's in the show notes. You can follow us on patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast wherever great podcasts are found. You can rate this show on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. You can sign up for our newsletter by going to our website or by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or you could share this episode on your own social media. Especially that last one. Uh, News travels fastest by word of mouth, which, you know, since the internet has been invented, is much, much faster than it used to be and ridiculously helpful. So please just, you know, slap this episode up on your socials. You think it'd be more or less helpful if they went to their neighbor's house and mentioned it also? Probably less. Depends on how friendly your neighbors are. Uh, Should we get back to the show? Yeah we see and uh, they point to Hebrews 7 a lot which Josh yeah. will read yeah so this is uh, again Christian Standard Bible uh, Hebrews 7 starting in verse 1 for this Melchizedek king of Salem priest of the most high God who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham appointed or sorry apportioned a tenth of all the spoils and was first of all by the translation of his name king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed are the sons of Levi, who received the priest's office, have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their countrymen although they are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had, pro- who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal man received tithes. But in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witness that lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi who received tithes, has paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his forefather when Melchizedek met him. So if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? So basically the question right now is, hey, uh, why did Jesus not come from Levites? Why was he in Aaron priesthood? Why was he from Melchizedek's lineage? For when the priesthood is changed, this is in verse 12, of necessity, there takes place a change of the law also. For the one about whom these things are said belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. Talking about Melchizedek. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning priest. So now he's talking about Jesus. And this is the clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has a priest, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life 
for it is attested of him. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is the nullification of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the introduction of a better hope through which we come near to God. Y'all should read that chapter for yourselves also. I know that's a mouthful and it's hard to follow, but super important when it comes to this topic. Uh, basically, the argument from Tyus here is saying that Christ is part of Melchizedek's priesthood. This priesthood, when Christ died, took over the Aaron priesthood. So instead of doing the tithes to the Levites, we now do the tithes to Melchizedek, like Abraham or Jesus. Right. Yeah, which is why that argument that some people make that Melchizedek literally was Jesus is actually an important argument when it comes to tithes. Because if he was, that pretty much settles it. Um, the scripture clearly claims that Abraham's giving to Melchizedek was a tithe. So we should tithe now because he tithed before then, right? That's sort of the argument from that side. The other argument against this being in favor of tithes uh, points to that part. I don't know if y'all noticed when I read it that said uh, the old law was useless and weak and is now replaced by a different law. And what they'll say is there's nowhere in this law that it says that tithes are enforced. In fact, even in this scripture, it describes what tithes were, but it never says we should tithe. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how that argument goes. You know, does it matter if this is a tithe? If Abraham's giving to Melchizedek as a tithe? Yeah. yeah. So, to emphasize the need for tithing, uh, many people point to Malachi 3. Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, starting in verse 7, Malachi 3 says this. Since the days of your ancestors, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of armies. So, people are complaining to God, being like, hey, why does our life suck? And God's like, um, you're not listening to the law. And uh, he says, yet you ask, how can we return to you, God? And uh, verse 8 says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? This is God talking, so you know. How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not ruin the produce of your land, and your vine in your fields will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. Yeah, so Amalekai, Israelites suck, which by the way, it keeps going on and God's like, hey, here's some other commands you're not listening to. But the first one he says is, hey, uh, your life sucks because you're stealing from me by not paying tithes. So naturally, a lot of the people who are proponent of tithes say, hey, see, this is important. God is mad when we don't do this. Right. Yeah. And uh, like one of the more modern questions yeah. is uh, how should Christians give? Which is a big deal because... You know, things aren't exactly the same. You know, land is a lot less plentiful. Most people don't have animals. Yeah, well, and because we're not all jumbled together. Me yeah. giving a tenth of my land to my pastor, he can't live on that. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. help him. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. He can have two acres from me somehow. <laughs> yeah, and none of us live in Israel, so... At least, you know... Not right now. None of us. But... Uh, it's it's that's really the bigger question behind the argument because a lot of early church fathers who didn't support tithing argued that it wasn't enough. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they said you know Christians who are true will have a heart to give as much as they can, you know, not an obligation. So that's kind of, and you know, the importance of giving is stressed in the story of Acts five, which I will read almost all of. <laughs> it's like half the chapter. You're fine. Uh, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Uh, Ananias, Peter asked, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? 
and after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you have planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. And when he heard those words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came on all who heard. You know, Peter's just like, Yeah, I'd be scared. Hey, why'd you lie? And they just died immediately. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that would be cause for concern, for me at least. Uh, for sure. The, the young men got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. Just right there. <laughs> hey, bro, you lied to God. Uh, and they just, he's dead. Just take him immediately, bury him. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty intense story. Uh, three hours later, <laughs> just it, it says, like, it even gives you the time frame. I, I like, feel like it's it, like a SpongeBob scene. You yeah. Know? Three this, hours later. Yeah. This happens within three hours. Yeah. Uh, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And uh, Peter said, uh, tell me, Peter asked her, uh, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Instantly, she dropped dead at his feet. When the young man came in, they found her dead carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Uh, then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. I was like, hey, <laughs> you lied to God, and he's just dead and immediately buried. And his wife's like, hey, you helped your husband to lie to God. So yeah. he just died, of, they, she got buried immediately. Yeah, the exact same thing. Yeah. Happened twice, to double emphasize the point. Yeah. Yeah. I just so, really wanted to make sure we didn't miss that. <laughs> We do want to clarify the reason that they were just fell to the floor and died and was drug out. This ha- this that whole thing it has nothing to do with tithes. They're not tithing in this instance. They're saying, "Hey, we gave everything for God," and they lied about it. Now, there's some argument about it was was it because they didn't really give everything? Was it because they lied? I'm comfortable enough telling you that I, I think it's probably because they lied about how much they gave. And the important takeaway from that story really is, which we've already said this, Christians want to give. If you're right with God in your heart, you have a desire to give. The people who are wrong in their heart will lie to try and look like a better Christian. Look how good Christian I am. I pay my tithes. I do this, and I mark it, and make sure everyone sees how much I give. Something's wrong in their heart there. And that is a much bigger issue than tithing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and now it's time for our Think Tank segment, which you know we do every time we do a Dividing Scriptures podcast uh, episode. And, you know, if you aren't familiar with our Think Tank, it's a group of... Uh, there's about 30 in there now. Uh, church leaders, pastors, whoever they deem worthy to invite. Uh, it's mostly previous guests, a couple future guests. Uh, they just represent different denominations in the church, which we're a huge fan of. Uh, we have everything from Greek Orthodox, Catholic, Lutherans. There are Pentecostals in there. We're Pentecostal, but, uh, if you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, basically, we just we ask them some of the questions from this episode and see what they think, but... When we asked if it's difficult for pastors and church leaders to talk about tithing and giving, uh, we had a good few answers. Uh, uh, William Lovett said, nope, everyone is always asking for money, which you know, <laughs> I yeah. assume is from the other perspective. He's but, joking. <laughs> uh, uh, Pastor Will Rose said it was difficult at the beginning of his ministry because it seemed like money grubbing. But as he grew and realized that giving is a vital part of one's spiritual health, then he became more comfortable with helping people in that area of their spiritual health. So like, yeah, like, no, I feel good about it now. It's, it's good for them. Yeah. Give me the money. <laughs> at the... We're kidding. Yeah. We don't think that Pastor Will's trying to take people's but, money. Uh, Reverend Keno Kennedy, big friend of ours, received one of our highest honors. Yeah. Plastic trophy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, said, no, because it is in the Bible. And then he, you know, posted like the big grand emoji. Yeah, yeah. Just the really happy one. That helps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
for visual. All right, so then we polled the same group to see what they believed about the necessity of tithing. Is it necessary for Christians to tithe? No one in our group said it was required for Christians or required for salvation or anything like that. Five said it was a principle to follow for how we should give our money and time, but it's not necessary. Two said tithing is not necessary in the new covenant, but all giving should be voluntary. And then uh, Father Jonathan of the Holy Trinity Orthodox Church, uh, he didn't answer any of the options, but he did explain that the Orthodox Church is on a stewardship model, and they are working to encourage stewardship to be a tithe. All right. Yeah. Uh, and then we polled, you know, after that, we polled the group and we said, we asked where tithes should go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had two people say your local church, which, you know, yeah. that, you know, that kind of makes sense. You know? That actually comes from the Malachi scripture right. we read where it says that the tithes were stored up in a storehouse that was in the temple. Yeah. Two of our, you know, participants said there's no need. Which, you know, they, they've expressed previously. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one person, we had one person say other. And that's right. Only five people answered. <laughs> that's typically how it goes. Get to uh, work. Pastors and church leaders are pretty busy people. Yeah. Uh, William Lovett, he, he voted that there's no need to tithe. But he explained that the tithe ended with Israel. Uh, not for Christians. And that Hebrews 7 is descriptive of past events, not prescriptive of tithing to a new priesthood. So, yeah, 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 pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. And uh, when asked who Melchizedek Ezedek was, I'm going to look up how to say that, and then I'm, pretty sure I'm never going to have to say right. it again. <laughs> uh, we had four people say that he was a type of the perfect prophet, priest, king, that is Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had one that said he was a literary archetype of Christ uh, pointing ahead to him. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, most people think he's like, you know, he's a pretty good guy, right? As close to perfect as you can get. Yeah. But uh, uh, we had Niles Merritt who voted that the type of the perfect prophet, priest, king, uh, he elaborated that he's heard good arguments from Melchizedek being Christ, uh, but it's not a definitive argument, so he holds to his view. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. that's a good argument, but can't yeah. prove it. And, and then we asked about the overall importance of a heart for giving, and William, we had William Lovett say, it is the natural outcome of conversion. Yeah, which, which I affirm wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, William Lovett's out there He's working. Doing good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's it for this week. This one, I guess. But, good yeah. think tank. Yeah, good think tank. Who knows? Maybe you can get on the think tank one day. Yeah, become a church leader yeah. or just messages, probably. All right. So uh, we wanted to dip real quick into church history. It's always important to see where those before us have fall- fallen on an argument for us to understand the whole church. We want a perspective of all sides, which is why we do our think tank, right? We want to see what other people in the church today believe and why we do into history because we want to see what other people in the church has believed throughout history. And that helps us get a better picture of all of our brothers and sisters and feel more like a family. So many early church fathers upheld tithing, but they had varying takes on why. So Clement of Alexandria, he upheld the tithe. He also upheld the sabbatical year. So just every seven years, you do nothing. Uh, He held the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, you just release all loans and everything. Just You're free, debt free, all that stuff. Pretty much all big mosaic law stuff. Clement of Alexandria was like, yeah, it's good. So a lot of us today would say he just had a kind of huge misunderstanding of the Mosaic Law. But not all of us, just some of us. Mm -hmm. He's a pretty literalist guy. Him and Chris will get along real well. (laughs) All right, so um, St. Augustine and St. Jerome believed pretty much the same thing. They believed that all Christians should give literally all of their profit, all of their income, everything to the church. Just give absolutely everything. Be one big community. Yay, communism. They didn't say communism, (laughs) but they believe Christians should give everything away. But they also believe that Christians of their time wouldn't do it. They were bad givers compared to the years before. You know, we all have people who complain about, right? Back in my day, we gave better. Okay. So that's pretty much what Augustine and Jerome said at the very beginning of church. Yeah. And that's that's kind of one of the unfortunate circumstances of modern society. Like we really couldn't live if we did that. Yeah. At least most of us. 
Yeah. And that's, you know, it's the same with like the year of Jubilee, you know, every yeah. 50 years. Yeah, we couldn't do that. Gone. No, people would absolutely just take out massive loans and just yeah not pay it back. <laughs> like, it'll be fine because it'll be absolved when I'm 60. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But uh, so both Jerome and Augustine then argued because people weren't doing it. Well, you, you should at least give as much as the Jews. They're given 10%. So they supported the tithe, but only because they just didn't think they could convince people to give more, which is what they thought people should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerome also stated, which was kind of weird given his beliefs, that he thought the tithe should be divided up pretty much equally between the poor and the clergy. So, interesting yeah. stuff. And uh, other early church fathers seemed uh, not to tithe or to be against the law altogether. Uh, Justin Martyr and Tertullian both described giving in their times as being completely voluntary, which is, you know, like, yeah. hey, you should just feel like it. Yeah. And um, Oregon, or region, or region. I've always said region. Yeah. That's probably wrong. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but he argued against any laws outside of the Ten Commandments being put on believers. He specifically argued against tithing uh, by saying that Christians should be giving far more than that. And it was clear that he did not tithe. So yeah, he, he, just yeah, wanted, he, he just told people, I don't tithe. I wanted you to know. Yeah, but should be giving far more than tithe. Just, you know, not to make it sound like he was against giving. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's not enough. No, that shouldn't be a law. That's way too low. Yeah. Uh, the church continued to argue the point in the Middle Ages, which was a bit of a, a rough time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thomas but not Aquinas made a clear argument against all three Old Testament tithes, saying that Christians had no need to pay any of them. Uh, John Wycliffe said, and John Huss, were in agreement that all giving should be voluntary, but tithing was a real, practical way to relegate your giving. Yeah, they were like, all tithing should be voluntary. But, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty practical way to do it. Just calculate mm -hmm. 10%, do that, yeah. Uh, there were many in favor of tithing in this time, too, including Charlemagne. Uh, and William yeah. the Conqueror, which what a guy, what a, what a guy. <laughs> but uh, that those are just some examples of people who have supported each stance. Yeah, throughout the Middle Ages, right. yeah. So then we get to the Reformation, and one that's just weird, and some people argue about. So we wanted to give a specific reference so you could look up and verify that we're not just making this up. Uh, Martin Luther, founder of the Protestant Reformation, was against tithing, and his sermon. This is. Look this up, guys. How Christians Should Regard Moses. Uh, it was in 1525. He said that all Mosaic laws were given to the nation of Israel, including tithing. He specifically mentioned tithing and said, So today, Christians are not part of the nation of Israel. Ergo, no tithe. Mm -hmm. yeah. It couldn't be any more clear than that. Uh, he just explicitly said, Tithes do not apply to Gentiles. Uh, John Smith. Some consider him to be the first Baptist. He also declared that ties were abolished with the old law. So Reformation, most of the reformers were against it. Uh, John Calvin was a little bit confusing, if you look into what his beliefs were. We're not really sure. Post-Reformation, though, uh, English Baptist John Bunyan, if you know him, it's because he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, he was also against ties. He said the pain, and quote, this pain of ties was ceremonial, such as came in, and went out with the typical priesthood. So he said, ceremonial priesthood is gone, ergo, ceremonial ties are also gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, a revival of the tithe has risen in the church. Uh, three main sources revised tithing in America, which were the Gospel Self-Supporting by Hogshead, uh, <laughs> the Law of the Tithe and the Free Will Offering by Miller, and the ministry of one Thomas Kane. Yeah, Thomas yeah. Kane's a very interesting guy. Yeah, super, super interesting dude to read about. Yeah, so we can't say for sure that Thomas Kane's ministry about tithing came from the Mormons, but I want to throw some dots out there for you to connect. So one of the only books at that time that was talking about tithing was you know either written or found by John Smith, the Book of Mormon. Explicitly says, hey, you should tithe. Right. Yeah. Uh, then, um, who is it? Uh, Young. What's his first name? Uh, Brigham. 
Yeah. So Brigham Young was the second president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm-hmm. came in right behind him. So the Book of Mormon is still pretty new, pretty fresh. You know, right. everyone knew it. So Young would be friends, Thomas Cain. Then all of a sudden, Thomas Cain revives tithing for pretty much all churches. Uh, Thomas Cain was a Presbyterian pastor who was close friends with the Mormon community. Right. Actually helped them get the state of Utah. Yeah, he, had, yeah. he played a considerable role in easing the Utah war. Yeah, but He also recruited a Mormon uh, ballista. How do you say that? I don't know. He recorded more Mormons to fight. It's pretty interesting. Battalion. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. A ballista is like a giant crossbow. Yeah, okay, you're right. Uh, one moderate commentator of this renewal was Pastor Morgan of Westminster Chapel. Uh, to him, only giving one-tenth was too little for many, and asking uh, for a tenth of others was too much to bear. And that's one of those things. It's kind of like taxes. Like, hey, I can't afford to pay that. But, you know, yeah. Rich dudes could afford to pay way more. But they pay less. Yeah, uh, which, which basically the argument would was you know if I'm making forty thousand a year, cost of living is thirty seven thousand. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to give up ten percent. Yeah. Whereas you know if I'm making a million a year, cost of living is thirty six thousand. Giving up a tenth is pretty much nothing. Right. Uh, and even more recently, uh, John MacArthur and Charles Ryrie both opposed the tithe. Uh, Billy Graham, you may have heard of him. John Stott and John Piper all affirm tithing as necessary for Christians. Uh, Jewish people today uh, only give 10% tithes, and it's the charity tithe. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, the Christian church primarily argues that tithes should either go to your local church or to your church's denomination or organization. Yeah. So that's kind of where things more or less stand today. You know, obviously yeah. people are still arguing about it, but... Yeah, they MacArthur wrote the MacArthur Study Bible. It's really popular mm-hmm. in some Protestant circles. So, still a lot of debate over the issue. Uh, but we can have unity and disagree about tithing. But we got to look past that. So, it's not enough to simply say, okay, we disagree about that, move on. We have to look at the heart of the issue. If you, regardless of what side you take, you can be in the right. You could be against tithing because you think people should be giving a lot more. You should be for tithing because you think that's. You know, just the bare minimum that people should be giving. But you also could have a wrong heart. You could be against tithing because you don't want to give. And then it becomes a first-tier issue because if you don't want to give, it's a pretty clear indicator of where you stand with God. Same thing on the other side. If you want to enforce tithes because you want to pretty much only give 10% when you should be giving a lot more, and that's just kind of your way out, got to look at the heart again. So it's probably lower than a third tier issue on face value, should we tithe or not. Mm -hmm. But on heart value, it's first tier. Right. Uh, All right. So we always end our episodes. Our frequent listeners know this. Yeah. Uh, By asking our guest, what's one practical thing we can do to achieve unity? You know, we didn't feel like it was right for us to just not do that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but you know, so we're going to give it to you, uh, but we don't want to impose an amount to tithe or anything like that. Uh, cause you know, that's why so many of these disagreements start and continue. Yeah. As soon as we impose an amount, half of you will say that's too much and half will say that's too little. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> instead our challenge this month will be to try to do an Isaiah fast if possible. And for those who might not know, uh, Josh, what is an Isaiah fast? Yeah. Isaiah fast is uh, my favorite fast. And that, that's all you need to know. My favorite fast <laughs> is Jesper Fast, Carolina Hurricanes legend. <laughs> yeah, Scored his first yeah, okay. goal this week. All right. So, no, an Isaiah fast is, um, I forget exactly where it comes from in the book of Isaiah. Uh, message us. I'll let you know. But Isaiah talks about fasting and says what a true fast is, according to Isaiah, is that you give up your meal, but you don't give it up in the sense that you just don't eat. You give it up in the sense that you take what you would have ate that meal and give it to someone. So it is a giving, you know, if you have a meal that you were going to eat this week, which if you're listening to this, you probably do give that meal to someone else and don't eat it yourself. Right. And it's kind of hard, uh, you know, for a lot of people to like just give because a lot of people are pretty stubborn and they're not just going to accept. So what you can do is take, you know, like the ingredients you were going to eat for that meal and then like donate it to a a soup kitchen or, you know, a pantry. Or you could do that thing, uh, 
You, you could go to a McDonald's drive through right. not order anything, or order a water. Be like, also, I want to pay for the person behind me. Mm-hmm. You could That's a pretty that. simple way to do it. Uh, so how will that help church unity, do you think? Well, first off, I think when you humble yourself, you uplift the rest of the church. Second, if we're all on this heart of giving, part of that heart of giving is outside of just money, right? Right. I want to give of myself to the rest of the church. So I think that kind of brings us all to closer in that, in that way. And uh, what we'll see as people do this is we'll see happier Christians, Christians who aren't just clinging to power and money, but instead want to make a real difference. And uh, I think that's really, even if you're not a Christian, that's what we want to see out of uh, the whole church. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, so we hope our time today has helped everyone better understand the whole church and, you know, where it stands on tithing even though it stands everywhere on tithing. It's like a format. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and has drawn us all closer in unity than ever before. Because, you know, at the end of the day, this doesn't determine where you can go to church or who you can talk to or who's a Christian. So, you know, yeah. it's an issue for sure. But yeah, like we said, the heart issue is really the one that matters. Right. And so we wanted to get straight to our God moment for this episode. And... You know, we all know what the God moment is here, except for you, new listener. Uh, <laughs> we just take a moment from, you know, recently where we saw God in our lives, whether it was a challenge or a blessing or a chance to worship or anything like that. And I always like to make Josh go first, just because it gives me a little time. Yeah. Um. Without getting too many specifics away, uh, I've been tempted to be really angry this last couple weeks. Not about any specific thing, just in general. I've had some aggravating situations. And um, even in my anger, I'm trying to show grace, humility, and kindness. And uh, that's been challenging for me. So, Yeah. Uh, mine's sort of a challenge, but like not really a challenge. Uh, you, you know, I've got some big things coming up. I'm going to move Hockey out. games? Nope. But yes, all right, I'm changing the God moment. 15% of fans are now allowed in PNC Arena. So, but uh, uh, anyway, big changes in seasons of my life are coming up. So kind of looking forward to those. And they've kind of started to get set in motion here recently. So, you know, that's always exciting. And, you know, you know God changes things. That's how it goes. I'm really aggravated that I can't remember the words to that one Toy Story song where it's like, big changes are happening around here. Me I have either. no idea what any of the words are, but I know it is part of a Disney song that I wish I could sing right now. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for listening to this episode. If you made it this far, you are an absolute soldier for the whole church. Uh, or a Marine, if you don't want to be yeah. a soldier. But- oh, something I wanted to mention. Uh, or that you told me we should do, that we're going to do. We're going to create a book list that they can access. Yeah. Where um, we're going to just talk about the different resources we used for this series, um, which today we pulled from a bunch of different, but primarily from, uh, what was it, Perspectives on Tithing, Four Views yeah. by David. Uh, David Co. It's it's David. Corto. Our good buddy Dave. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, s- uh, books like it's that. Um, next week, or in the next couple weeks, you'll hear Pastor Will Rose. He'll suggest some sources. And we're, we're just going to kind of compile a lot of these mm-hmm. together. Uh, the way you can access that is by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com or by going to our website, which is thewholechurchpodcast.captivate.fm. And uh, there, if you listen to any of the any of our podcasts, It'll have a thing for, that has a link symbol, and it'll give you a few different links. One of those links will be to this right. book list. Yeah, so it's, it's just going to be sources we use and recommendations from people in our think tank group, and then, you know, recommendations from us, and, you know, maybe there's going to be like one or two secular books on there. Who knows? Probably Alice not. in Wonderland. But. Read it. Anyway. Good book. Uh, some future guests for the podcast. Uh, we've got Pep. I'm sure you all know who Pep is. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, I write Pep instead no. of Pastor Martin? No. Okay. Pastor J.R. Martin, uh, you know, good friend of ours. Pastor Will Rose of the Trinity Luth- Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill. Not Miles Raleigh. Merritt. I made you say Raleigh once. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is our correction. Mm-hmm. Niles Merritt, who, you know, probably the most name dropped non <laughs> uh, participant in our podcast, but not for much longer. And of course, at the end of this season, we're going to have Francis Chan. Wow. Mm-hmm. You never told me that. Yeah, no, we haven't told him either. Oh, I, also, you tell me that every week. Yeah. But uh, he'll, he'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. Yeah. It'll happen. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys for listening. If, if you want to check out the end, well, this is the end. But if you want to check out the extra <laughs> stuff, which isn't very long, but it's super worth it, uh, slide over to Patreon. Give us give us a give us a couple dollars. I'm not extorting you. I swear. <laughs> this isn't a tithe. Yeah, it's, don't don't tithe on Patreon. Yeah. It won't count. <laughs> but you know, just head over there, do that, yeah. check it out. Give freely. Give freely, not <laughs> to us, or to us, or to us. But do both. both. Anyways, um, hope to see you guys again next week. Yeah. So. Do 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 do. Bump.